Everyone is doing well. Hope you've had a good week. Uh, as I'm sure you can tell, my voice is not 100% today, so it's just something we'll have to work through. Uh, I'd say it's about 85, 90%. So, uh, again, something we'll just have to work through. But, again, it's good to see everyone here this morning. Again, I hope you've had a great week. It's good to see the Woodsons back. Uh, they were in Hawaii, so that was, uh, but that was awesome. Uh, good to have them back. Good that they had safe travels. Uh, so, here's what we want to do this morning as we continue our study in the book of Philippians. Uh, we want to review what we looked at last week, uh, which is very important, and then we want to finish up what we started last week. After that, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our next section today. So uh, let's be reminded of what we noticed last week. Remember, we began chapter 2, and chapter 2, remember, is pretty much all about, or at least the, the first 11 verses there, that first section is all about the kind of mind that we ought to have. Uh, remember we entitled that section, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, let this mind be in you. And here within this section, Paul, in essence, has done four things. Uh, he has, firstly, uh, told us the kind of mindset that we ought to have. What is this one like same mind that we, as Christians, ought to have? Well, he reveals that to us in verse 3. It is a... Uh, a oneness of mind, or excuse me, it is a, a lowliness of mind. That is what he's referring to there. And so really this entire section goes back to verse 3. Verse 3 is where we see that kind of mind we ought to have. What is this one mind we ought to have, this like and same mind? It is a lowliness of mind. It is a mindset of humility, of selflessness. And so that's the first thing that he's done, is he's introduced this mindset. He's told us what it is. The second thing that he's done here is he's described it. He's told us what kind of actions this mindset produces. And we see that in verses 3 and 4. Remember the Bible says there, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And he goes on to say there, look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. And so whereas we as human beings, you know, we normally put the focus on self, whereas this mindset puts the focus on others. And so again, he has introduced this mindset, told us the kind of mindset we ought to have, a mindset of lowliness, and then he goes on to describe it. It is a mindset of lowliness, of selflessness, of humility, one that puts others before itself. The third thing that he's done here, which is where we're at uh, today and what we're going to finish up, uh, in verses 5 through 8, he has given us an example of this mindset. Remember who that example is? It is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate example. He has mastered this mindset. And remember, we're not just looking to Jesus here, okay? We're not just looking at his story to look at his story. Paul is doing something here. He's using Jesus as an example. What can we take from him? And we're seeing here all this humility, all the things that Jesus did. He humbled himself, he abased himself, he was in the form of God, but he came and emptied himself of that form, of that authority, he came in the form of men. He submitted himself to, to God, to the law of Moses, to the laws of the land. He humbled himself. And so, you know, this is what our Lord did. And we're going to see in this example how far this mindset goes. And that's very important. We're going to see that in the next verse here, verse 8 of Philippians chapter 2. We're going to see how far this mindset goes. Again, we're not just looking to the story of Jesus to look to the story, okay? We're looking here at Jesus as an example. What does Paul want us to know? What is he trying to convey? Again, he's conveying the kind of mindset, the kind of actions that this mindset produces and how far it will go. And then finally, we'll notice uh, very briefly, we'll summarize verses 9 through 11, the last three verses there. And in these verses here, we in essence see the fourth thing that Paul does. So again, what has he done? He has introduced this mindset. He's told us what it does. He's given us an example. And he's going to show us how far it goes. And then finally, in verses 9 through 11, he's going to show us, in essence, the rewards or the effects or the results of this mindset. Okay, so we'll see that in just a moment. Now, again, we left off with verse 8 last week. We will pick that up uh, right now. And again, we're still uh, kind of uh, towards the end here of talking about Jesus as our example of lowliness. So let's look here at verse 8. Let's, uh, let's uh, break it down here. 
And then we'll finish this uh, section and then move on to our next. So notice with me verse 8. The Bible says here, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now this goes back to, again, verse 6. He was in the form of God, the Bible tells us. John 1 and verse 1, he was God, okay? But that was, past tense, indicates the fact that he emptied himself of that form. That's what the Bible says here. Uh, that uh, made himself of no reputation there in verse 7. Uh, the Greek, uh, in essence, says that he abased himself or he emptied himself. He was in the form of God. He emptied himself of that form. And he came in the form of a bondservant, which is the likeness of men. That's what we see here. He was found in appearance as a man. He was a human person. Again, as we see here in verse 8. And if you notice here, verse 8 continues, and it says that he humbled himself. Now, friends, this is very significant. Very significant. Now, when you think about Jesus, who was God, no, I mean, when you think about him, he was in the form of God. He was always with God. You know, we can go back to John 1 and verse 1. And remember what the Bible says there. John 1 and verse 1. Uh, John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? But yet we see here that he humbled himself. When you think about the fact of Jesus humbling himself, that is something that Jesus had never done in his entire existence. Jesus had never, at any point in time, humbled himself or submitted himself to anything because he was there in the form of God. He was on the same status as, as God. But again, he made himself with no reputation. I think it would be safe to say, and maybe you, know, you can correct me if, if this doesn't sound right, but you know, whenever Jesus came in the flesh, I think it would be safe to say that at that point in time, that was when the relationship between God and Jesus became that of father and son. You know, God became the father, Jesus became the son. The relationship changed from being equal status to then a status of submission on Jesus' part. Jesus came to proclaim the will of the Father. He came to convey what the Father would have him do. He came to do the Father's will, right? He humbled himself when he came in the flesh. But that submission, that humility of Jesus, it expanded to more than just God. Yes, he humbled himself before God. He took on that, that position of being the Son. He submitted himself to the Father. But he, it goes even beyond that because he submitted himself uh, to those things that we as human beings, as human persons, are also subject to as well. He not only submitted himself to God, but he also submitted himself to God's law, the law of Moses, to the laws of the land, uh, to the governing rulers and leaders, uh, to, to the elders and rulers of the people, to his parents, to the laws of nature. Uh, that last one's kind of optional at times. Of course, when Jesus did miracles, there were times where he defied the laws of nature. But overall, generally speaking, he, you know, he conformed to all these different things that he had never, never conformed to anything before. He had never submitted himself to anything before whatsoever until this point in time when he became a man. He humbled himself. He emptied himself, abased himself. He, uh, again, emptied himself of the form of God. And so, again, this is very significant. He had never done this before, but he learned obedience by the things he suffered, the book of Hebrews tells us. Now notice verse 8 continues, and this next part is perhaps the, the entire point of this section here. I want you to notice with me what we see here. This is how far this mindset goes. Notice the end of verse 8. The Bible says, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Again, we're not just looking to the story of Christ here. Paul is using Christ as an example of lowliness. How far does a lowly, submissive, humble mindset go? My friends, that's what Paul is conveying here. It goes to death for others. That sounds extreme, doesn't it? It sounds extreme. But that's in essence what he's telling us here. This is the extent. This is how far we ought to go in our mindsets for the sake of others. And the Bible teaches us that. Paul's not just you know, conveying this here by implication, but we can even you know, remember the words of uh, 1 John 3 and verse 16. The Bible tells us there, by this we know love that he gave himself for us. Again, the example of Jesus. 
And then it goes on to say, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is how far this lowly, selfless, submissive mindset goes. It will go to death for others. That's how far it goes. This is what Paul is, is conveying here. He's showing us not only what Jesus has done, how selfless he's been up to the point of leaving heaven and coming to earth, but he's shown us how far Jesus has also gone in that mindset of humility. You know, if, if we didn't uh, have the example of Jesus, then we probably wouldn't have, have known the level of, of lowliness that we ought to have gone. But yet we see here Jesus shows us how far a lowly mindset will go. It will go to death. And so again, we're seeing here an example, and then we also see here the extent of how far that example went. It will go to death to put others before itself. Any thoughts concerning the example of Jesus and, and how far a lowly mindset will go? Any thoughts, any comments? I believe Brother Paul has the mic. If uh, you have any comments throughout this period, anything at all. Okay, well notice with me verse 9. Verse 9, well actually let's combine verses 9 through 11 here. Uh, again, we're finishing up from last week, and so I want to just kind of get the idea here of what, we're, of what Paul is conveying. So let's read verses 9 through 11 here. The Bible says, Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that at the name of Jesus, or, or excuse me, that at, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, there are a lot of things that we could say here about our Lord. I believe one of the things that Paul's doing here is praising the Lord. He's, he's exalting Him. Uh, you know, he's, he's showing here the fact that it is Jesus who gets all the praise and glory. Uh, or, you know, we're going to uh, all submit ourselves before Him one day. Uh, and really, what we're seeing here is justice, you know. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Okay, Jesus was rejected by men, but he was praised by God. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 talks about that idea. But all who rejected Christ will one day acknowledge him. They will confess his name and they will bow before him. And so that's uh, one of the main things we're seeing here in verses 9 through 11. But, but what is the main thought that he's conveying here? You know, besides just the fact that Jesus uh, gets all the glory, all the honor... Well, again, he's still continuing his thoughts about lowliness, okay? If you notice here in verse 9, focus here on verse 9, he says, therefore, okay? He's continuing those thoughts of lowliness. He had just talked about, in verse 8, what Jesus had done. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Friends, what we're seeing here is, in essence, a, a pattern or a sequence, Okay, what we're seeing here is, in essence, the result of a lowly mindset, the result of humbling ourselves. Okay, so again, what did Jesus do? In verses 5 through 8, we see here that he humbled himself. Okay, he humbled himself in the flesh, in this life, in this world, before God. And what was the result? Well, again, verse 9 is telling us that therefore God exalted him. The same thing that happened to Jesus will also happen to us. We are seeing here the result, the effect, the reward, the benefit of having a lowliness of mind. Jesus humbled himself, and what happened? He was exalted. And friends, the same thing applies to us. If we humble ourselves, submit ourselves in lowliness in this life, right now, before God, before others then one day we too will be exalted. We will be lifted up. And that is a biblical principle. Remember the words of James 4 and verse 10. The Bible says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. We will be lifted up if we first humble ourselves. I love the words of 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, also conveying this truth. The Bible says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that... He may exalt you in due time. How will we be exalted in due time? We must first humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. That's the exact same thing that Jesus did. 
This will always be a result of humility right now in this life. If we humble ourselves, if we take on this lowly mindset, if we put others before ourselves, then, my friends, the result will always be exaltation. That was what happened, and that was true in the case of Jesus. And Paul is conveying here the example of Jesus. That will happen to us too. If we humble ourselves right now in this life, we too will be exalted. Again, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and what is the result? He will exalt us in due time. We will be exalted in due time if we first humble ourselves. And so again, this section is awesome. This section is excellent. Because again, Paul is going in great detail about this mindset. He's told us what this mindset is, a mindset of lowliness. He's told us what it does. Uh, it puts others before itself. He's given us an example in Jesus. And we know how far Jesus went. And he shows us how far he went to the point of death. And then we see that if we do that, then ultimately we, like Jesus, will be exalted. This is the result, the effect, the reward of a lowly mindset. Any thoughts, any questions, any comments, anything concerning this section of chapter 2, verses 1 through 11? Concerning lowliness, concerning Jesus. All right. All right, well, now we want to move on to our next section, which is chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Before we do this, let's begin with a word of prayer. And then we will introduce this next section. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this blessed day that you've given us. We're so thankful, we're so blessed that we have the opportunity to meet together as your children, as your saints, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to be able to study your word. I pray, Father, that we take these words of yours of the scriptures and apply them to our lives. I pray, Father, that we always use the right means of interpretation, that we always rightly divide your word of truth because there is a way that we can wrongly divide. Peter tells us we can twist the scriptures. And so, Father, I pray that we always try to go on the straight and narrow, that we always look to your word. And I believe that's every single one of our goals this morning, to, to understand what your word says. Father, I pray for open ears and open hearts as we... Uh, come into contact with your word that can change our lives. We love you, Father. Thank you for first loving us. It's in the name of your Son that we pray these things. Amen. So again, uh, chapter 2, we're going to be beginning here in verse 12 through 18. But let's introduce this section real quick. I've come to entitle this section simply, The Work. The Work. Uh, the reason why is because we see in the first couple verses... Uh, in verse uh, 12 and verse 13, the word work is mentioned in the New King James Version. And uh, he's also going to give here, in verses 12 through 18, some further instructions concerning what we as Christians ought to do. Okay, and so he's going to tell us some things that we ought to do, which is, you know, a part of our work, our labor, the things that we do as Christians. Uh, we're also going to see in this section several words that relate either synonymously or very closely uh, to that word work. We're going to see the words uh, obey, do, become, run, labor, service, and all these relate in some way uh, to the idea of the work that we as Christians ought to do uh, in this life as Christians. Uh, and so clearly this is a context of action, a context of action. And we're going to see that very clearly as we go throughout this section. So let's begin here in verse 12. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, the Bible says, <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now again, Paul has just dealt with the right and proper mindset that we ought to have. And remember, he used Jesus as an example of that by showing his obedience that came from that lowly mind. And now, he's going to talk about our obedience. He's going to talk about the things that we ought to do. He's established a mindset. And if we have this mindset, if we adopt this mindset, that we're going to submit to God, no problem. Because we have this lowliness, this humility, this selflessness. I'm going to put others, I'm going to put my God before myself and what I want. <clears throat> 
And so again, he's going to be talking about, again, the work, the obedience that ought to be done on our part. Now, uh, as he you know, begins to talk about this obedience, notice with me primarily his approach here. Notice how he approaches the brethren. He says here in Philippians 2 and verse 12, My beloved, therefore, my beloved... Now, Paul does not, you know, go into this section, you know, just, you know, gunslinging, saying, hey, you need to work on this, you need to work on this, you need to fix this. You know, that's not what he does here. And Paul could have done that. I mean, he had, he's an apostle. He had authority in the first century as, as an apostle. Uh, he could have, you know, given orders left and right. He had that authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But Paul always appealed to the brethren, especially here, brethren who he loved so dearly, out of love. You might remember in the book of Philemon, uh, verses 8 and 9, we see that very same thing. Remember, Philemon was a former slave owner, and Paul had actually come across his former slave in prison. And he had, quote, begotten him in his chains. In other words, he converted him to Christ while they were both in prison. And he was going to send Onesimus back to Philemon. And Paul, you know, in essence addressed Philemon and said, you know, I could command you to receive him as a brother instead of a slave, but rather I'm going to appeal to you out of love. Again, Paul as an apostle, he could have said, here, you're going to do this and this. I have the right to, to, to make these commands. But nonetheless, he always appealed to the brethren in love. Nonetheless, I appeal to you in love. That's what he said there in Philemon. And he does the same thing here. To his beloved brethren, he says, therefore, my beloved. And that's something to, to note here. Uh, as we begin verse 12. And so we see here his approach. is out of love. And now he's going to go on to mention what they ought to do. And he says here that the Philippians have always been obedient. The Philippians have always been obedient. We know the, that Paul knows the Philippians well. He knows their faithfulness currently and their track record uh, up to this point too. And really when you think about this statement here, this is quite a compliment <laughs> A, quite a compliment, especially coming from Paul, uh, for him to say that they have always been obedient. You know, that's saying a lot about this congregation. You know, you know, by way of self-examination, we could ask ourselves the same question. Can I honestly say that I have always been obedient? And speaking for myself, no, <laughs> I have not always been obedient. And so this really kind of puts us into perspective here, you know. If I can't even say that of myself, this says a lot about the church of Philippi here as a whole. They had always been obedient. Paul says it about them. Now, of course, he's speaking of them generally as a congregation. Uh, that's not to say that every individual had always been obedient. But again, he's, he's saying here that they had always been obedient as a congregation, as a whole. They'd always been consistent in this. And again, that really puts it into perspective when you think about Yourself, Have I always been obedient? Well, when you think about the Philippians, Paul says that they have, again, as a whole. And so this, this word here, always, it indicates a lot. It indicates that they were not easily wearied, that they were people of endurance. You know, this goes back to the fact that they uh, were enduring suffering also at this time. You know, going back to the end of chapter 1, Paul mentions their adversaries. And we know of a truth that... They had always had opposition from day one. Ever since the church was there in Philippi, there had always been opposition. But yet, even in the face of opposition, these people had not wavered. This church had remained true. And that is, again, saying quite a bit here. They were always faithful, not just in the good times, but also in the difficult times. Again, uh, very, very uh, complimentary things that Paul's saying here. This is a great congregation. Now, he goes on to talk about their obedience, and he says concerning their obedience that it has not only been in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Uh, he's saying here that this congregation was, was faithful consistently. They were consistently faithful, not just when I'm around, but also, he says, much more in my absence, even when I'm away. You know, Paul was kind of like their parent in a way. He had begotten them. He had... He was the one who brought the church to Philippi. He was the one who brought the gospel to Philippi. He was the one who, in essence, begot them. He birthed them, if you will, like a parent, like a father, like a mother. Uh, and, you know, these were, quote-unquote, good children. They were faithful children. 
And that's, in essence, what parents want of their children, to not just be good when you're looking, you know, when you're watching, but also when you're not around, to be consistent, to be truly good from your heart, not just hypocritically when, you know, an authority figure is, is watching, is looking. And that's certainly something that can be said of the Philippian church here. They were obedient always, at all times, not just when Paul was here, but even in his absence. And Paul's saying here that, that this obedience that they had, it was consistent. It was from the heart. It was sincere. And that's kind of what Paul instructed the bondservants in uh, Colossians uh, chapter 3 and verse 22. He instructs the bondservants there not to you know, serve their masters with eye service as men pleasers, but to do so from the heart. And that's in essence what could be said of the Philippian church here. They did not just serve the Lord with eye service as men pleasers. They weren't just seeking to please Paul. They truly sought to please the Lord. They were consistent. They served from the heart. Uh, Romans 6.17 talks about obedience from the heart. And again, all this can be uh, applied to the Philippian church. This church was not hypocritical. They didn't just obey when Paul was around, but even in his absence. Who you are when nobody is looking is who you really are. And we could say of the Philippian church that who they really were was faithful Christians. That's who they were. When Paul was there, when he wasn't, they were consistent people. And so this shows here the genuineness of the Philippian brethren. Notice with me the next phrase here in verse 12. The Bible says here, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now this has disturbed many a denominational commentator. What does this mean? Does this mean I have a part to play in my salvation? Well, the Bible says what it says. We have something that we ought to do in relation to our own salvation. There's something that must be done on our part for this salvation. We are to work out our own salvation. And so, you know, we need to understand works in relation to salvation. Are works important? Well, yes, they are. You know, whenever we think of works, we often think of meritorious works, things that we do in and of ourselves. And, of course, that's, those are the kinds of works that the Bible condemns. <laughs> There's nothing in all the world that I could come up with, something so good or so great or, or an amount of, of good things that I can do that will ultimately save me. God is not going to look upon my life and say, wow, you've done some good things. I'm going to save you. The reality of the situation is there is nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to be saved. And so here's the key. Where do, where do works come in? Works come in when they are in the realm of what God has said. Uh, we cannot be saved. The works that we do to save us, they are not of ourselves. They are from God, okay? And so that is where the line must be drawn. That's the key. Apart from God is the key. God has required things for us to do for salvation, but they are His own specifications, not our own. Okay, so there are things that must be done. Again, when we think about works, we think of meritorious things, but works are just simply actions, things that we do. And, you know, for some reason, those things are discredited. Those things are completely discounted in the denominational world. Uh, but for those who discount works altogether, you know, to them, I'd like to ask, you know, by what then are we going to be judged if works do not matter? If the things that we do in this life and the flesh have no holding upon, you know, the judgment day or anything like that, then by what criteria are we going to be judged? Because the Bible tells us that we're going to be judged by the things that we've done. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, the Bible says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We are going to be judged according to the things that we have done in this life, in this flesh. Works do matter. And again, when we think of works, we always think of the good things that I've done, but works just simply mean actions. We're talking about works in relation to what God has told us to do. That, my friends, is where the whole crux of the argument lies. It's not in what I've done, it's in what God has told me to do. Those things are the things 
that we must uh, engage ourselves in as New Testament Christians. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are those who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Friends, the truth of the situation is our works are going to follow us into eternity. And they will either do one of two things. They will either help us in the day of judgment or they will haunt us. Our works will follow us. The things that we've done in the flesh, that is the criteria by which we will be judged, by our actions, by the things that we've done in this life. And so works do matter. Not only when it comes to God's plan of salvation. We must hear. We must believe. We must confess. We must repent. We must be baptized. We must remain faithful. All those are actions. All those are things that we do. All those are action words. Those fall under the realm of works. And so there's not only things that we must do with, you know, things that God has instructed us for salvation, but also when we have become saved, there are things that we must do. There are things that we must do in this life. Uh, to continue in the work. Uh, Colossians 1.23 talks about continuing in the faith. It talks about, you know, going about the Father's business, if you will, continuing in that. And so by saying, work out your own salvation, Paul is literally saying that to maintain salvation, we've got to keep at the work. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. There is work for us to do. Works do matter. Actions do matter. We will be judged by those actions. Brother Buchanan. I was just wondering, uh, I don't know if you mentioned it, but of course you had the great treatise in James I'm sorry, I, I can't 14. hear you. Could you put the mic up? Okay, I'll try again. Uh, I don't know if you, <clears throat> James 2.14 is the great treatise by James regarding faith versus works. Mm. You know, 14 says, it, you know, what does it profit? My brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? And the conclusion will be faith without works is dead faith. He goes on to say that uh, by my works I will show you my faith. Mm. So there is a very intricate connection between faith and works. There were some things we know in the Jewish people who tried to do a lot of different things, but it wasn't through faith. It was they were trying to build themselves a home in heaven by doing things. But Jesus pointed out a long time ago that it's by love what you do is what counts. So there is a balance there. And I think it's balanced on the pinnacle of love between faith and works. But there, it is a joint operation. Yes. Uh, that is so true. The fact that these two are inseparable. Faith and works are inseparable. Uh, it's one thing to believe in God, but remember the rhetorical questions that, the, that James asked there in, in James 2 and verse 14. He says, what is a prophet, uh, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Those are rhetorical questions, and the answer to those rhetorical questions are no. Faith in and of itself cannot save us. Now, faith saves if it is accompanied with works. And that's really the point of James 2. He's telling us what faith needs to be alive. And, you know, we see there in uh, James 2 and verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You separate your soul, your spirit from your body, you are dead. There is not a thing that you can do. You are inoperable. You are lifeless. And the same thing is said here of faith. Faith does say, but we must qualify it with what it accompanies, what makes it living. Faith, not just believing in God, but also, you know, responding in faith. You see, see, that is one of the major things that many, many miss in Christendom, in the denominational world, is, oh, they believe faith, but they forget the qualifier that makes faith living, that makes faith valid. It is actually living that faith, you know? And so, again, we see here that faith without works is dead. It is lifeless. It is inoperable. We must, there are things that we must do. And so, you know, you know, people always turn to the passages that say, you know, faith saves us. And it does. It does absolutely save us. But again, we must qualify that, you know, what makes faith living? What makes it actually lifeless? What must it also have with it? Not just believing in God that he exists, but also believing in what he said and doing what he said. You know, uh, Brother Lamb. Another verse that kind of another verse that kind of ties into this is found in Matthew seven verse 
twining and following where he says you will know them by their fruits so mm -hmm. that shows actions we'll know by people's actions you know if they're true to God or not right and Matthew 7 21 through 23 goes on to say not everyone who says to me Lord Lord these people clearly believed in the Lord, the ones that Jesus was talking about. They called him Lord. They acknowledged him as Lord. They confessed his name even. But he goes on to say, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who acknowledges me will be saved, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. There's more than just acknowledging, okay? Hebrews 11 and verse 6, we must not only believe that he is, that he exists, but that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Who will God reward? Those who diligently seek him, those who act, those who put forth effort to attain a relationship with God. And so again, a lot of things that can be said about, about works here. But again, we're seeing here, we're to work out our own salvation. And again, he's in essence referring to uh, the fact that uh, we need to maintain that salvation by keeping at the work. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Continue in the work. Continue in the labor. Continue in the Christian life. Notice with me verse 13. Verse 13, the Bible says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Now, there are two roles that are played in man's salvation. God and man's. Both have a role in man's salvation. Both are working towards, or at least man should be working towards, that salvation. Of course, without God, salvation would not even be an option. Uh, but again, there are those two parts, God and man. We are to work out our own salvation. In verse 12, he talks about our role. We need to continue in the faith, keep, keep working out that salvation, continue in the work. But we see here, it is God who works in us as well. God works in us as well, to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he, he works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure, uh, but it says what it says, and he does it, you know? And so I believe that. Perhaps it's like the words of James 4 and verse 8, you know, we must draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. If we diligently seek him, pursuing and working out our own salvation, then perhaps maybe he strengthens our will and desire to continue that work. But friends, one thing that we can take from this the main thing that we can take from this is that we are not alone in this work. Again, that's the, that's the, <clears throat> the idea of this section here, the work, okay? But notice here, it's not just us, ourselves as human beings, working alone. We're not just working out our salvation with fear and trembling, but as we go on to see here, God is also working with us. We are not alone in this work. God is involved with, in the midst of, and working for his people. And isn't that a comfort to know that God has not just left us alone to this work. God is also working towards this mutual goal. We ought to put forth the effort and work towards that ultimate salvation. You know, Paul's going to go on to talk about that idea in chapter 3. You know, the idea of persevering towards the prize. I've got to keep going. I have clearly not attained the prize yet. I've clearly not you know, obtained heaven. I've clearly not uh, been transformed. I've not seen Jesus yet. All these things, Paul says, I have not attained. And that means that there's still, you know, a portion left in this track, a portion left in this race to run. And so as long as I have not attained this prize, this goal yet, I've still got to keep going. There is work for us to do, and God is also working with us. And that should be a comfort to know that God is working as well. Any thoughts concerning verse 13? Verse 13. Brother Woodson? <clears throat> not, not necessarily just 13, but I've been thinking about the discussion of faith and works. And I think we could add a little bit of a third leg to that stool in that lowliness of mind. I mean, we can do the faith and the works in the wrong way, too. We've got to have that lowliness of mind. Yes, I agree. We must have the, the right kind of, uh, of intentions as well. You know, uh, Joshua talks about that idea in uh, Joshua 24. You know, let us serve, let us choose us this day uh, whom we will serve, whether it be the gods across the river or uh, the God of Jacob. 
And he mentions there in that context the idea of sincerity, you know, serving God with our actions, but of course doing so with the right intentions, with the right motives as well. Uh, we must have that mindset of, of holiness, of being separate from this world, doing so in the right way. Let's continue now to verse 14. Verse 14, the Bible says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. Okay, now again, we've talked about the work and obedience. And now he's going to get specific with one uh, particular thing that we ought to actually do. Again, what, what should we do in this work? What kind of things ought we to obey? What kind of commands do we have? Well, here's one. He mentions one specific command, one specific thing that we need to, we need to heed here. Again, very simply, he says, do all things without complaining and disputing. Uh, now, we'll not spend a, a great time looking at these definitions. I have them written down here if you'd like them after class or something. But uh, uh, ultimately, what these words here are conveying, complaining, uh, disputing, or arguing, ultimately, these go back to the idea of, of something both outward and inward. If we are grumbling, if we are complaining, if we are debating and arguing, uh, these are things that we can do not just outwardly with our words, but also internally. I, let me read a couple of these definitions, actually. Uh, concerning complaining, Thayer says, murmuring, muttering, a secret debate, a secret displeasure not openly avowed. And so again, this is something that can be outward or inward. We can complain and argue and debate, not only outward, but also in our mind. We're talking again about working on our mindsets here. Uh, concerning the word disputing, or a better English word is arguing, or even debating, uh, Thayer says, the thinking of a man deliberating himself, a thought, inward reasoning, hesitation, disputing, arguing. Okay? All these definitions indicate the idea of something that can be done both outwardly and inwardly. Complaining, arguing, debating, disputing. These are not good things. These are not things that promote unity, especially. And really, I guess you could say this is kind of in the context of, of unity. He started out in chapter 2, uh, in verse 2, he says, Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Murmuring and disputing are not things that promote unity. These kinds of things separate. These kinds of things disjoin. They do not join together. You know, I think there are probably a lot of you know, maybe causes for complaining and arguing. Um, you know, maybe ungratefulness or selfishness, a lack of contentment, a lack of a submissive spirit, anger, resentment. You know, I wish we had time to get into all these, but, you know, if, if we are the kind of people who do these, and this is a very easy command to overlook. You know, I am not innocent of this. You know, it's very easy to not want to do something. You know, and even if you manage to not complain or argue with someone outwardly, it's very easy to still not be content in your mind as well. Oh, so easy to do that. You know, there are tasks in this life that we may not want to do. I don't want to do that, you know. And so, you know, complaining might come from this. It's a very easy command to overlook. But, you know, it could come from these kinds of things, from sin, resentment, anger, lack of contentment. You know, ultimately, I think these kinds of things are contrary to the things that we ought to be filled with. Love. If I love my brethren, then I'm not going to, you know, promote this kind of disunity. If I'm filled with joy, then there should be no room for this kind of negativity. If I'm filled with peace and contentment, then why, you know, am I grumbling in this situation, you know? But, again, just some thoughts here. Now, friends, notice with me verse 15, okay? He is continuing these thoughts here. In fact, uh, last quarter when I began studying this, you know, I had no idea the Bible had so much to say about the idea of complaining and disputing. Because here in verse 15, he's going to go on to, in essence, tell us the downfall of these things. And, and, and if we abstain from complaining and arguing, then there are so many things that, I guess, doors that are opened for us as Christians, you could say. Now, notice with me what we see here. Oh, we have a comment. Brother Lamb. You know, Paul had to deal with this in another congregation in 1 Corinthians. They were having factions, and it was causing problems because they were uh, not of one mind. They were splitting up. And, and uh, he goes on in the next verse to say, you know, 
the world will see how you're acting and your influence, you need to be mindful of that. We're told that even if we uh, are required to suffer for the cause of Christ, we need to count that as a joy. And that's something the world would, wouldn't understand. Yes, the Corinthians had a, a huge issue with that. Uh, they were completely and entirely selfish. They had the opposite of a lowliness of mind. You know, we see that in 1 Corinthians 6. They were taking each other to court. They wanted to get from their brethren what they could get, you know. Uh, but Paul said, wouldn't you rather be cheated? We, should ought, we ought to rather have been cheated than to, you know, be conveying this kind of disunity among ourselves. Brother Buchanan. You know, it's, it's unique if you go to the, well, I say unique. If you go to the Old Testament and look at the stand that God took against the people of Israel for murmuring, he would tell them at one point, I hate murmuring. And then in the New Testament, you find they started, in Acts 6, they started murmuring against the uh, Hebrews for the Grecian women and their widows, and, and it started all again until by the time you get to Philippians, um, verse 14, he said, do all things without murmuring. But I think it's what you said earlier, and it, and it really uh, caught my idea that if you're murmuring and complaining, you're not content. One of the scriptures tells us is to be content with what you have. Mm -hmm. To be content, if you're murmuring and complaining, you're not paying attention to the things that should make you content and should content you. So, I mean, it really is something that God was strove against many times for people complaining about what they have. Be content with it. I love that you brought up Israel. Uh, that's such a, a great truth. You know, they were experts at that. <laughs> and we see what happened to them. And so, you know, Romans 15, verse 4, those things are written aforetime, are written for our learning. A lot of those who murmured and disputed, it didn't end well for them. And we need to learn from that too. As New Testament Christians, we cannot uh, participate in these kinds of things. Now, very quickly, I wanted to convey to you some reasons here. We see here in verse 15 some reasons why we ought not to complain and dispute and argue. All right? So we'll do our best to cover these in the last few moments. But the first thing he says here, and I've broken this down into five things, five reasons why, that you may become blameless. Uh, isn't that a, a, an interesting thought? If we're to be blameless, then we've got to put off this thing that comes very natural to us, to complain and dispute. That's something very easy to do. But we've got to put that off if we are to be blameless. It's hard to accuse you of anything when there's not a thing to accuse you of. If you're even innocent in the area of, of grumbling and, and arguing, then what accusation can be brought against you? And so by eliminating something as small as this, no one can say that you're guilty of ungratefulness or anger or negativity or pessimism or anything like that that comes with complaining and arguing. Another reason here. He says here, if you are to put these things off, then you will be harmless. Now, friends, think about this. I think this is very significant because complaining and arguing are not constructive. Complaining and arguing do not help situations. They do not promote positiveness. They do not encourage. We're called to encourage. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 Comfort one another and edify one another, just as you also are doing. We're called to edify. We're called to build up. Complaining and arguing do the exact opposite. They are not constructive. They are destructive. They cause more harm than help. And remember the Bible says in Matthew 10, 16, Jesus himself tells us that we're to be like doves, harmless, innocent, gentle. And, you know, when you think about those kinds of words, complaining and arguing do not fall in that category. If we're to be harmless, if we don't want to hurt others, if we don't want to discourage and promote disunity, if we want to promote unity and constructiveness, then we must put away this kind of speech from our, our language, this kind of conversation, murmuring and arguing, disputing. We have uh, three more that we'll pick up in, the next, in next week, but again, we're going to see here three more reasons as to why. Uh, we ought to put away murmuring and disputing. So we'll stop there this week, and then we'll continue these things uh, next week. Thank you for your comments and for your attention this morning.